buttons and switches. How could that be a topic? Buttons are pressed or not pressed. Switches are on or off. And there you go. Well, there is additional complexity. For the most part, that's true. But you get to how many poles a switch has. Not poles, poles, P-O-L-E-S. How many throws it has. I mean, here's that button that's either pressed or not pressed, so why does it have four pins? Basically, there's all kinds of buttons and switches, and in their essence, that's what they are. You press a button, you switch a switch. But for example, this is a single pole double throw switch. It has on or off, but it connects to two different circuits and it switches between them rather than being open or closed. Or you can connect only two wires and it's an open or closed switch. Sort of like how you can use two or three pins of a potentiometer and go between voltage divider and variable resistor. Now sometimes the extra pins are there just to make it easier to wire. You can use one side or the other, or in this case, because the button is rather large and you're soldering it onto a PCB, having four poles gives it extra stability, more solder gripping it on all four points. But what really matters is how they're wired. One quick note, buttons are also known as momentary switches. So really all of these open and closed devices, as in not analog like a potentiometer, just something that's open or closed or switching between and it's only one at a time, are called switches and buttons are momentary ones. They're also called buttons. So I do not have examples of every single type of switch out there to demonstrate, but I have a few. And as usual, we're going to pretend that we know nothing about them and quickly use a multimeter and breadboard to figure out how they're wired up inside. Let's begin with this button. It's a simple push button, momentary switch, and it has four pins. So there must be something unusual going on with this. Let's find out. So I will take four male to female header wires, and I will put them onto the switch. Now, I might be able to get this into my breadboard, but it looks a little goofy, so I'm not going to try. So I'm going to put one there, one there, one there, and one there. These are not the strongest of connections. If I were actually doing this for real, what I would do is I would make what's called a breakout board. I would flatten these pins out. I would secure the button to a board, like a piece of wood or plastic, and I would solder wires to the four pins, or at least attach them and perhaps hot glue them down. I will actually make some breakout boards in the future, but right now we're just going to be very careful. So I will connect all of these wires to different ones of these. And I'm not going to worry too much about which wire is which. Spoiler, I already know what this button is, because this is really awkward. So we'll just put that right there. Now, with our multimeter in continuity mode, we're basically going to measure the continuity between pairs. Now the button is open right now, I'm not pressing it. So it should be an open circuit, right? But there's four pins. So how does that work? So first is always sanity check, make sure your thing is working. And it is. Let's put that a little closer. There we go. Now, I'm going to measure between whatever pin this is, again, I'm not keeping track of which one it is, and this one. Nothing. How about this one? There's continuity there. How about this one? Nothing. So, we'll just call it pin 1, is not connected to pin 2, is connected to pin 3, and is not connected to pin 4 with the circuit open, with the button not pressed. So with the button just sitting there, two of the pins are connected. They're continuous. So now, let's do pin 2, because it was not continuous with pin 2. Any of them that are continuous have to have been, have to have made a noise. It can't, none of the others can be connected to the first one because it would have lit up. So now I'm in one of the ones that did not sound. So obviously if I put in the first one, no sound. But let me put it in the other one that didn't sound. So two pins are connected, another two pins are connected, but not to each other. The two pairs are not connected to each other. So let me connect between two of the pairs. See, no noise. There's a noise. No noise there. Now I'll press the button. See? And just to illustrate, let me do the other pair. Oop, not that one. Let me do these two. And I'll press the button. So basically, this button is just a normal push button where one side is one side of the circuit and the other side is the other side of the circuit. But two pins are connected. So basically, it allows you to have more stability again, to put it in the PCB. Uh, it allows you to connect two things together in case that it was easier to run your wires. Uh, it allows you to do one pin over here and one pin on the other corner if you want. So basically just stability in mounting it to the board and flexibility in wiring. Now, you could actually wire 
an entire circuit across one side, an entire circuit across the other that both work all the time, and when you press the button, the two circuits are connected. Why you would want to do that, off the top of my head, I have no idea. But this is the kind of thing, keep in mind, someone, somewhere, sometime, might find a use for that. A wise and practical woman named Tarma once said, no learnings ever wasted. Just because you don't know, and I don't know what that's good for, maybe you do know. But just because I don't know, doesn't mean somebody doesn't know. I haven't learned everything. None of us have. So just keep that in mind. When you notice something can be done, just think about all the weird little things you can do. Just put it in the back of your mind and leave it sit there. And then 15 years down the road, you might be like, oh, hey, but if I could only do this one little thing with a button. So now let's try a switch. It's got three pins and it's just got a little knob on the top, back and forth. It's got two positions, two positions, three pins. So once again, we're going to check the continuity. And fortunately for our sanity, or mine at least. This one, when I purchased it, specifically said fits in a breadboard. Nice and easy, perfect. Breadboards have standard spacing. They have a standard size of the hole and a standard distance between the holes. So you can always be sure, I believe it's 0.1 millimeters. Off the top of my head, I actually forget, but go look it up and make sure that your part fits in there. If it says that's the spacing, then it's probably going to fit. There's a bunch of integrated circuits that are designed to work in breadboards for prototyping. You can get the same chip, the same transistor, the same linear voltage regulator, the same of a lot of things in different packages. Surface mount that goes on a PCB, through hole that actually mounts through the hole and is soldered so you can connect to traces on both sides, uh, breadboard for prototyping, all kinds of different form factors. Different form factors with different numbers of pins even. Let's not belabor that point. We'll go into that another day. So right now, first of all, with the switch, let's say that way. Let's measure continuity between pin one. Let's make sure where the pin is. Okay. Pin one and pin two. There is a connection. That is the pair of pins where the little nubbin is. Makes sense. How about pin one and three? Nothing. Two, three, pin two and three. Makes sense. Let's do the switch the other way. Pin one and two, nothing. One and three, nothing. Two and three. So this is probably our simplest device yet. You have three pins. If the nubbin is on one side, it connects to those two pins on that side. The nubbin is on the other side, it connects to those two pins on that side. So for example, you could have your positive voltage hooked up to the middle pin, and then the two outside pins connect to different parts of the circuit. Depending on which one you switch, the power will go into that part of the circuit and power that side. Or think about it in reverse. For example, what if you had something that you wanted to be powered high and low. Let's say you had two power supplies inside your machine, a 12 volt and a 6 volt, and you're hooking this up to a fan or whatever. So you actually have the 12 volt connected to one side, the 6 volt connected to the other, and the device connected to the middle. So the middle is now an output instead of an input. And so whichever way you switch this, it's getting 12 or 6 volts of power, high and low. So that's the different ways you can hook up a switch like this. Now what if you just wanted it to be a simple on and off? Well, just connect two of the pins. Connect the two on one side or the two on the other, whichever side you want to be on. So like if you want on to be up and you mount it vertically, then your circuit goes across the top two pins. So when it's down, it's connecting the bottom two pins and one of those pins is nothing. There you go. This one is very simple. My barrel jack switch. I won't bother to demonstrate it again, but basically this is a genuine simple on and off. These two ends with the switch off are broken. They don't do anything. On, it's just a wire. So this is used for like if you have a power supply that uses a barrel jack connector but it has no on and off switch. You can just use this and give it an on and off switch. Sort of like how some headphones don't have volume controls but you can buy a separate one that you plug in. There you go. And as I said, there's a billion and eighteen different types of switches. But this is the final one I'll show you. This is called a dip switch set. And apparently I have bent a wire in storage. So let me just try and straighten that out. It's a good thing these parts don't cost much. Sometimes things happen to them. So this one again was designed to fit in a breadboard, but it's got Basically, it's eight switches. So DIP stands for dual inline package, if I recall correctly, where you've got 
two lines of pins, and it is specially designed for breadboards. So you'll notice the blue and red ones here are power lines, like this one connects all the way down and all the way down. These are for power rails, so it's easy to connect parts all over and you make a bunch of them. But these lines, each row connects, so the five over here connect, five here, five here, five here connect, and then these are separate. Notice there's a little river, a bridge, a separation here. This is exactly designed to fit, there we go, right over that bridge. So you've got only the closest on this side and the closest on this side. So you've got all four remaining for each pin on both sides to work with. And of course the, the switches each individually switch. So it's just simple, it just connects across, across, across eight different switches in one package. These were more common in the good old days. You'll still find them in motherboards here and there, but back in the day you would configure bits like this. For example, there's eight switches here. If you hook up power to all of them and the other end to your microcontroller, then you can do a number from 0 to 255. It's a byte. You can specify each bit of a byte. And in fact, each bit could mean something different. Even further back in my father's time, back in the tape and punch card days, you would even have switches, physical switches, like big old on and off light switches on the front of a device, exactly like this, only much bigger. And you would set them on and off for bits, press a button and it would accept the byte and set them again. These are used to configure the old IDE interface, uh, primary, secondary, master, and slave. These can be used to basically configure anything on a motherboard that generally you don't need to be configuring all the time. So it doesn't have to be easily accessible, but it should be nice and stable and easy to change. So you just have some switches on the motherboard. Of course, modern computers, pretty much everything is in the BIOS. And you might have one jumper to clear the BIOS settings in case you've overclocked wrong and then an emergency reset button or something. But this is how we used to do it and how you still can. It's pretty good for hobbyist projects. You can even use it for configuring a sequence of devices. If you have one of these in each of your devices, you can set them to different values and it'll be a unique identifier for each one. This is device 0, 1, 2, 3. And it's in hardware, which keeps it away from any enterprising hacker that will find an exploitation in your software. You know, you have a kiosk with a keyboard board and mouse and you don't want people getting in there you know there might be a bug in your software that somebody can find and mess around with it but unless they get a sledgehammer or a crowbar they're not getting to the dip switch so it can be a form of security as well so very briefly i will just show you some circuit symbols so your super simple regular on and off switch the barrel jack one will be this open and closed. Basically one side of your circuit connects here, the other side connects here, and you can see this is supposed to be a little conductive switch. When it's open there's no circuit, when it's touching the other side then it's conducting through. So that's a simple single pole, single throw switch. This is a single pole double throw switch. Again, not pole, it's not throw and pole, it's throw and pole, like pole vaulting, north pole. So as you can see, you can connect one side of your circuit here and then two different parts of your circuit here. This was the three pin switch I showed you. So it's always connected to one or the other. It just switches which one it connects to. So like I was saying, let's say you have one battery here and two batteries here. They're connected in series, so it's double the voltage. And then you want to connect to your load. So both batteries grounds, of course, negative terminals are connected together. One of the power supplies goes into one pole. We're doing it backwards. This is technically a throw, but if you look at it this way, it goes into this throw and that throw. It doesn't matter. Just look at how it's wired up and don't worry about the terms. Talking about the poles and throws is only useful when you're purchasing the thing. And then that just connects to your load and that one back to ground. So if the switch is this way, you're getting 1.5 volts. If the switch is this way, you're getting three. So it's high and low. And then of course, the dip switch was just eight switches. Again, there's no interconnection between them. It was just a package of eight switches, nice and easy to work with, perfectly sized for a breadboard, and also mountable on a PCB. And the final one I'll show you is a button, also once again known as a momentary switch. So you'll notice some similar symbology here, you know, these little circles that were there, but in this case, it's a little that presses down. Switches are available in two types, normally closed and normally open. A normally open 
switch, if you're not pressing it, it's open and not conducting. If you press it, it closes. This is the common type for obvious reasons, because you can easily have a spring in there that keeps them apart, and you apply force with your finger, or whatever, and it compresses the spring and connects, and then the spring lifts it back up. A switch that's normally closed, and when you press it, it opens, is just the opposite. You know, much less common, obviously, but it's there. Should that happen to be good for your circuit. For me, I think that would be a little silly, and I would use a normal button and a logic inverter. But you're not always using logic. First of all, you might have an incredibly cramped PCB and you don't even have room for an extra logic inverter. Or you want to keep the cost down and every single penny matters. But in addition, sometimes you're not working with logic, sometimes you're working with straight power. So if you want something to be always connected and just occasionally stop being connected, then you would use one of those switches to save yourself a transistor. You may think I belabored the point, but I'm trying to really be clear about this. There are so many different kinds of switches. You could have four-pole dual throw if you want. If you have a two-pole, two-throw switch, then you've got two separate circuits that are both on or both off at the same time. It's all a matter of wiring. So yes, things are simple if you want them to be simple, but if you need something advanced, I just want you to know that there are options. When you're designing circuits, it is much better to assume you can do something and during the design process find out you can't. Because if you go in and assume that you can't do something or it doesn't even occur to you then you're going to be gimped in your design you know better to better to try to do something and then look it up in the catalog and say oh i can't afford three dollars a chip so i'll do something else but don't decide that until you look in the catalog and see the price tag you know don't go in there until you've seen whether or not the part you want exists there's nearly a dozen types of diodes alone before you even get the transistors for all i know there are super special ones and there are over a dozen did you know that there are very variable capacitors? I learned that today. That's going to be an interesting thing, but until then, be seeing you.